Welcome. Good morning. We have a beautiful day. Um, everybody's been asking what, what our plan was if it rained, and I said we didn't have plan B. This is what we were expecting. So welcome to what is approximately our fifth annual, but now renamed the Innovation Summit. I'm John Soderstrom, the Managing Director of the Office of Cooperative Research, um, and our office is the host for this day but we really welcome you all here for what is becoming um, our kind of capstone event for the year. Um, we started this about five years ago. We had around 100 people show up. Um, every year it's gotten a little bit bigger. Um, I'm not gonna tell you exactly how many people pre-registered because that will get me in trouble with the School of Management who is our glorious host here today. Um, but suffice it to say it's way more than we had last year. Um, but I wanted to uh, take the opportunity to thank some very special uh, sponsors because there's lots of stuff like free food and, and all the other things that we have that goes with this that we could not possibly pay for ourselves and we are absolutely dependent upon uh, sponsors. Uh, there are four leading sponsors that we especially want to talk, uh, give thanks to Elm Street Ventures, Connecticut Innovations, uh, Goodwin Law, and for those of us who have been in this field way too long, they are no longer Goodwin Proctor, they are Goodwin Law, so just remember that, and Pierre Fabre, Fabre. Um, I also want to give a shout out to some other sponsors who have also been uh, supportive. Alexion uh, Biohaven Pharmaceuticals, our newest IPO last Thursday, awesome. Bulldog Innovation Group, Canaan Partners, Celdex Therapeutics, Charles River, Evotech, Hamatsu, um, Mirtha Kalina, Yale New Haven Health, Pfizer, Spring Mountain Capital, and last but not least, Wigan and Dana. So if you join me in thanking our sponsors, I would appreciate that. Um, I also, I, I've already mentioned uh, that we are being hosted here by the School of Management and their beautiful facility. So one of the things I'm gonna ask you all is to please abide by the signage uh, no food and drink in here, um, and please recognize that we are their guests and we try to be great guests and not do any damage while we're here. Um, so I just want to thank, thank SOM for, for letting us use this facility. I also want to give a shout out to um, my staff, uh, particularly Bill Wiesler, who has been um, really honchoing this thing since the beginning of time. Um, and has also been the person who's been most responsible for putting together the program. Uh, Tim Obstrup and his entire staff who are really doing the logistics and the people with shirts on that you see that say Yale Innovation Summit, those are all my staff members. And we also have a bunch of our students who are working with us as well. So um, if you wouldn't mind, help me thank them as well. <laughs> all right, let's get on with this thing. So. Um, every year, um, the second week in January in San Francisco at the St. Francis Hotel is the biggest biotech investment banking meeting, healthcare investment banking meeting. Uh, now JP Morgan, uh, some of us still remember it as Hamburg and Quist or H&Q back in the day. Um, but this year when I was there, um, I had the opportunity to go to a, a, one of the a meeting and when I walked in, there was this guy, um, who you'll meet in a few minutes, giving this really fascinating talk about innovation. And it was, it was fascinating to me because I'm like, this is what we're trying to do here at Yale. This is what we've been trying to talk about and what we've been up to. Um, I need to get this guy to, to come to Yale. Um, and so I went up to him afterwards. Now, you have to understand, I've just met him. He doesn't know me from Adam. And I said, we do this thing and it's gonna be big, and it's gonna be in May, and I need a keynote speaker to really set the tone for the day, and what you're talking about is what we, is the message that we're trying to uh, put out there. And I have to tell you, without even looking at his calendar, he said, yep, I'll do that. Um, now, subsequently, I found out that I'm in trouble with him for a lot of other reasons, because he's doing this, he did a talk la yesterday, he's doing a talk tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, and he's on this whole East Coast swing, so we're catching him while his, Vocal cords are still in good shape. But I want to introduce you to Jim Hornthal. Jim is one of these Renaissance people. Not only is he a successful serial entrepreneur who started one of the first um, online 
uh, travel companies, which ultimately was merged with Sabre, which then became Travelocity.com, um, and he continues to do all those things. Um, he is also an angel investor who has been pretty successful with some of the investments, like in Lending Club and Lyft and some of the others that he's been involved in. But he is a passionate missionary evangelist for entrepreneurship, particularly for student entrepreneurs, and he teaches um, in the Bay Area at places like Stanford and Berkeley, um, obviously gives talks all over the place on his favorite topic. Um, he acts as a mentor for lots of different startup ventures. Um, but one of the things that I find really interesting if you go and read his actual bio online, and there's plenty of things you can go read about him, but he's been intimately involved in areas of taking entrepreneurship and using it as a way of bringing peace to some areas of conflict. Pakistan, India, Israelis and Palestinians, and so he is also a philanthropist um, at heart. But I have to tell you, he is an engaging speaker. He is really a great guy, and so I would ask you to join me in welcoming Jim Hornthal to the stage today. Thank you, John. Is this on? Jim, am I good? With that kind of an intro, I am sure to disappoint. And um, you know, you'll always remember where you were the morning after James Comey was fired, right? So you were here. <laughs> and, uh, and, and by the way, leading from behind as John has done, I think he deserves a round of applause. This is an amazing day he's planned for all of you. So join me in thanking John. <laughs> so, so being from California, we're not allowed to wear ties, but I noticed John's tie was a double helix. And it was, I thought it was great that he bought a tie to tie into my talk, which is about the innovation genome. And I, I gave a talk at TED in 2011, but I gave an 18-minute talk in six minutes. And so the punishment for throwing so much content in such a short area is I had to write a TED book. And the TED book was on a haystack full of needles. And it's about looking at the concepts of genomic science through the lens of every other area, uh, in, in music, in art, in politics, in news, where you can actually underscore the significance of data to gain new insight and understanding. So, R&D is kind of a funny thing to talk about. We spent $1.8 trillion as a planet in R&D in 2016. That's more than the war on terror. Um, it's not as much as uh, Trump's tax cuts, but it's a big number. And what's interesting is the more you spend does not correlate with the more you get. In fact, there are often in inconsistencies within companies R&D going on in silos, information not being shared, a whole bunch of inefficiencies. But if the more I spend does not correlate with the more I get, why is this the case? So we're going to go back in time 19 years ago. South Park, season two, episode 17, for those who know their South Park history very well. Let me set the stage for you. Uh, anyone not familiar with South Park can quietly get up and leave the room right now. So the boys in South Park have a challenge. All of the underpants are being stolen. And the boys are kind of concerned, because who doesn't want their underpants? So they go and they discover under the city of South Park, under the town of South Park, are underpant gnomes. And the gnomes have stolen all of the underpants in South Park. Trust me, this will come back to innovation. We actually were going to call our company phase two, but no one would quite understand why. <laughs> so, so the question, as innovators all, is how do you go from a great idea, phase one, to phase three, where you're executing and making those elusive profits? And phase two is really about commercialization. It's how do you go from a cool idea, a patent, some interesting piece of IP, or just a key insight? And how do you make the journey from what is arguably a, a reasonable idea to something that is actually a powerful business model that is repeatable and scalable? 
Uh, my co-founder of Launchpad Central, Steve Blank, is fond of saying that a startup is a temporary organization, even though Google wants to still pretend they're a startup. It's a temporary organization. And their only purpose is to find a repeatable, scalable business model. And until you do, writing a business plan is crazy. In fact, I'm a, I hope Yale doesn't have any business plan competitions. I think they're the worst thing in the world. <laughs> Unless you're an English major in fiction and creative writing, in which case it's a fabulous way to exercise those skills. But it never happens. And it never happens because you're missing some key signals, uh, some key signals that actually can be understood. So how do you navigate that great abyss? How do you go from what sounds like a great idea to what is an incredible, powerful business model? And when you talk to large companies, and we spend a lot of time doing that these days, every company of size and scale today was once, believe it or not, a startup. But the way they got to be successful is they are execution ninjas. They know how to make the trains run on time, uh, unless you're United Airlines, separate topic, um, much different topic. But, but often, how do you make things slightly better, slightly faster, slightly cheaper? That's horizon one innovation. It's not easy but you're pretty much searching for solutions to the kind of known problems. Search is hard. The only thing harder than search is discovery because you don't know what you're searching for. I, I gave a talk seven or eight years ago at a, at a Google conference and Sergey Brin was talking about the only thing harder than search is discovery. And you know, when you go to your doctor and they say, how do you feel? You don't say, guess. You give them symptoms. You talk about what's the problem. If anyone remembers the TV show House, differential diagnostics is how do you kind of hone in on what is that thing behind you. And the tools of discovery are elusive, and yet we all understand the basic mechanics. We just often ignore them. So here's what we've learned about innovation. We've learned that no successful business today is where it started. None. We've worked with 15,000 teams. We've analyzed 500,000 interviews, 50,000 pivots, and none of them wind up where they are. Does anyone know what Google's original business model was? It was a utility box in the corporate enterprise to search company information. Damn, I wish they'd stayed in that business. Um, and all Jeff Bezos wanted to do was sell books and maybe CDs because they kind of look like books. They just don't have pages. Um, and the evolution is all the mistakes and changes along the road. It wasn't a straight point. Um, I had a professor who once told me, never mistake a clear view for a short distance or a straight line because it looks like I could walk right out and touch you, and if I do, that would be a bad idea. So it's not as easy as it looks. It takes time. And historically, there's been no way to keep track of all the learnings and pivots. Imagine if we were all part of one organization, if we were distributed across different divisions and products in time. How do I know the mistakes you've made and share them with this team so they don't make the same mistakes over and over and over again? That's why we spend $1.8 trillion reinventing the same mistakes and within a large company, it's really paralyzing. And the other part of being accessible to those mistakes and successes is it's the learning process. And part of the learning process is where I met Steve Blank seven years ago. Um, after selling um, Travelocity, I got a call like the next day from a friend who was at the Haas School of Business. And literally, the ink was still wet. And he said, what are you going to do next? And I said, I have no idea. He said, well, you should become a Lester Center Fellow at the Haas School of Business, which sounds like amazing, right? Who doesn't want to be a fellow? And I said, Jerry, that sounds great. I'm sure that the title comes with an equally impressive compensation package. And Jerry said, well, there's free parking. We have t-shirts. I mentioned the parking. Um, uh, we got a coffee mug and, oh, by the way, parking. And I said, Jerry, you had me a parking. So for the first five years, I was essentially a pinata. Harvard wrote a case on my company. I would show up when they taught the case. They'd hoist me to the top of the room. They'd beat me with a stick, and hopefully something good would come out. And I met Steve Blank, and Steve was starting a new class. Steve had taught a course on customer discovery. His first book was Four Steps to the Epiphany, which is, you know, I don't care what happens in the building. I need to know what's going outside the building. I need to talk to customers. And he taught the customer discovery course, but it wasn't enough for him. He wanted to teach a new course called the Lean Launchpad. And the Lean Launchpad was going to take teams of students out of the building and start a business. That was the goal. We learned very quickly that the only thing worse than four engineers who could build anything but did not know why was four MBAs who could sell things that could not possibly be made. So we started building hybrid teams. And we learned that diversity, resiliency, and tenacity were the critical characteristics of a successful team. And we start teaching this course. And I said, well, Steve, how's it going to work? He goes, I'm not really sure. We're going to make it up as we go along. 
I said, well, I'll come to the first class. So seven years later, I haven't left. We're teaching it at Stanford or Berkeley. Uh, Kara Davis is with me from Launchpad, who runs the academic part of our business in 300 universities in 100 countries around the world. That was interesting, but what really interesting is Steve blogs everything. So anyone who's never been to steveblank.com should. It's sort of ground zero for lean innovation and entrepreneurship. Steve was approached in five years ago by a gentleman named Errol Arklich. And Errol introduced himself and said, Steve, I'm with the NSF, I'm with the government, we need your help. Steve said, I served in Vietnam, I'm done. Um, Errol said, no, 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 not militarily, academically and intellectually, we think you're doing some really breakthrough work. The NSF has a problem. So let me tell you about the NSF. One of the few bipartisan things our Congress passes for the last 40 years is a $7 billion research grant. The smartest men and women from all over the world, I can't continue to say that based on changing travel policies, but from all over the world, come here to our finest institutions and do basic research. Why do we do this as a country? Why is this good public policy? Well, the answer is South Park. Innovation leads to job creation. Innovation leads to industry formation. Can you give me an example? Yeah, Sergey and Larry got an NSF grant at Stanford. That worked out pretty well. Qualcomm, hundreds of companies would not have started without NSF grants. So the NSF said, are we good at innovation? The US Patent and Trademark Office issued 550,000 patents last year. Check the box. Tons of great ideas. But that job creation, that commercialization needs to happen, and the NSF wasn't doing it. So they reached out to Steve and said, we want to create a program. We're going to call it i the Innovation Corps. We're going to take teams of our brightest scientists whose science seems to be progressing in the lab and see how they can actually turn it into something commercially viable. So Steve and Errol collaborated, and I showed up to be part of the teaching team. And when we say teaching team, these are investors and entrepreneurs. With all due respect to career track academics, um, we're trying to bring a lot of truth, not just theory, to the reality of innovation. And when we did this, I sat in the back of the room. This is kind of an inverted lecture hall. The teams present every week. We sit in the back of the room. We throw water balloons and try and create some chaos. And there were 25 teams. It was exhausting. And the teams put up what they thought their business models were, and trust me, none of them were even close to what they needed to become. And I asked Errol how he thought we were doing. John Fiber from Moore David Al, John Burke from True Ventures, myself, Steve Blank. And Errol said, you guys are doing great. This is amazing. And I said, Errol, we have no idea what we're doing. We're just making this stuff up. We're, we're snidey and snarky and funny, maybe, but we don't know what we're doing. What's the vision for this i thing? He goes, well, we're going to run cohorts, 25 teams. We're going to run them three times a year in a node. What's a node? Well, Berkeley, Stanford, UCSF could be a node. Columbia, CUNY, NYU could be a node. We're going to run these things decentralized. I said, really, how many nodes? Well, maybe 10. I said, 10 nodes, three cohorts a year, 25 teams. Each team does 100 interviews. Holy shit, you're going to have like a million data points. And he looked at me and said, what do you mean? I said, well, you're going to be doing customer interviews, and you're going to have pivots, and you're going to have activities, and mentor involvement, instructor involvement. How are you going to know which are the best nodes, instructors, teams, and mentors? He goes, I have no idea. I said, well, you need an operating system for innovation if you're going to build something at scale. And I said, um, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. I said, Errol, you're the NSF. What do you mean you didn't think about it? He goes, well, I'm going to need that really soon. And then I got nervous. He said, yeah, that group in the back, they're from University of Michigan. And that group over there, they're from Georgia Tech. And they're going to be doing this in a few months. So you better get to work. I said, what do you mean I better get to work? <laughs> You're not paying me. I'm just showing up. He goes, no, you have to build an operating system for innovation. So we started for the NSF to create a program that would capture all the nuances, all the changes, all the mistakes, all the errors, all the failings, so that that system could scale, which is now being used by the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Energy, the Department of Defense, because it's important that we learn from our mistakes, and there will be many. Thomas Edison's famous for saying, I haven't failed, I just found 10,000 ways that don't work. Okay. Ted Turner was famous for saying when he won the World Series, I wasn't losing, I was just learning how to win. This is a page from 1876. And what you can note in Edison's lab notebook is copious notes of everything he could possibly perceive. Because we're not sure what's significant. And if you go today to the labs of the 21st century, there are sensors recording ambient light, temperature, humidity. If you ever go to a, a, a neonatal intensive care unit, the oxygen levels, the pulse rate, the respiration, all that data is coming in. And the reason you want to absorb as much data as you can is you're not sure what might and might not correlate. So this is actually a big data problem. 
just like the human genome, just like any genome, is if you can get underneath the big data, you have a chance of looking for patterns. I will tell you in my career, whenever I've been fortunate enough to have success, the honest truth is luck, timing, and pattern recognition. Uh, found one of the, the president of Hamburg and Quist, which John mentioned before, uh, the late Dan Case, would say he's only good at one thing, which is pattern recognition. And let me tell you what a gift that is, because you don't want to make those same mistakes over and over again. So building a pattern acquisition and recognition capability requires a couple simple steps. I'll save you the $2.95 of buying my TED book, which, by the way, the FDA approved last month. It is actually now off-label use. It's a cure for insomnia. <laughs> it's about 50 pages, and to my knowledge, no one's made it past page four. Don't try, uh, especially before you drive. But ontology is a simple word. It means I'm going to organize the world, and we're going to see an example of business ontology in a minute from Alexander Osterwalder. Then you have to have taxonomy. So let's figure out the world. We're going to call these countries. We're going to call these states. We're going to call these cities. Let's all agree we're going to call this New Haven. If someone wants to call it Paris, no one will know what you're talking about. Trust me, it ain't Paris. Um, and then some algorithm, fancy word for formulas, artificial intelligence. There's an article this week that Watson's a joke. I'm not sure it's a joke, but it's a bunch of fancy, fancy formulas to tease out correlations of statistical significance. That's all it is. And then some way to visualize. If you're going to analyze and synthesize this data, you damn well better be able to visualize it better than that last screen of lots of phosphorus greens and yellows glowing, because that means nothing to nobody. So we're going to build a pattern acquisition. And there's something to be said about the wisdom of crowns, James Sirowaki's group. You want diverse opinions. You want independence. You want decentralization. You want aggregation. A lot of people confuse their peer group as a smart crowd. Not that they're not smart because they went to Yale and they're all you know, brilliant, but they have similar biases. And so a truly independent perspective is not in the building. So I don't care what any of you want to build. I care what the customers want you to build. And the biggest problem in most failures of startups is we have a tendency to fall in love with what we know. We need to learn to fall in love with learning what we need to know. And that's a huge difference. So how do you do discovery at scale? Well, you certainly want to hear what your employees have to say, your partners, your team members. I mean, if, if John, me, and Kira were going to start a company today, and someday, someday we'll have six people. It's easy. We all own all the knowledge. We all know the anecdotes. We all know the stories. Small companies that are still founder-led don't have the problem we're about to describe. You want to look around and get some signals from the research companies. But let's be very clear. Research companies are famous at predicting the past. If they could predict the future, they would be running hedge funds, and they would be billionaires. So let's just agree there's something about knowing what is possible, when it might come, what the big trends are. But do not confuse someone's projection for the year 2022 as anything other than their delusion and their fantasy. And then outside the building, what does the marketplace say, need, want from this brilliant idea that I'm sure we have and that we're working on? So one way to think about this is this microscope of feasibility. What is plausible? What could we do? But remember what about desirability, the telescope of looking outside and beyond me. Now, if I've got feasibility and desirability coming together, there's a product market fit. We actually can see how this could work. But is it adaptable? Regulatory changes, technological changes, competitive changes. We do some work with a three-letter acronym security agency who loves to say, Yesterday's technology, tomorrow. Yes, they're still running DOS computers. So you want to know that you haven't created this wonderful thing. And, and um, I'll give you a real life example. Um, <laughs> in the dark days when I was in business school, studying by candlelight because Edison wasn't yet invented the light bulb, um, classmates of mine actually invented the first spreadsheet. It's called VisiCalc. Before that, you might want to say, why is it called a spreadsheet? Because you literally would have to spread out a long sheet and with pencils, erasers, and things called slide rules, look it up, you would crunch numbers. It was a miserable program to use, but it was so much better than the alternative. And industry grew up and for nine months flourished and died. It was the VisiCalc template industry because it was really hard to use. Guess what? Customers got smarter and the software got better. And Lotus 123 made it easier. Now today we've gone to Excel. And from no matter what you want to think about it, relative to a true spreadsheet, it's really nice. So if you want to build something that's got a chance of adaptability and all that comes together, congratulations. You've gone from the microscope to the telescope to the periscope to the stethoscope. You have a chance at viability. 
But back to the ontology, understanding how those come together is looking at an organization's innovation capital. So what do I mean by innovation capital? The people on the team, advisors, mentors, accumulation of what their initial ideas are and a culture that does not punish failure. So we do a lot of work with the Mayo Clinic. And the final presentations that the teams make are in an auditorium bigger than this. And sitting right there is the chief science officer of the Mayo Clinic, 50,000 employees. People dream of bumping into him in the hall one day. Maybe he'll know my name. And there they are on stage telling what they've learned. And 90% of those teams, the answer is, and we're not going forward. This does not make sense. And when the chief science officer is the first one standing, giving a standing ovation to every team because their effort makes the Mayo Clinic smarter and better, that's the culture that rewards experimentation. Because how many of you have taken a class in physics, biology, or chemistry ever in your life? Come on, you can admit it. Scientific method. I have a hypothesis. I'm going to run an experiment. I'm going to get results of the experiment. It will inform me as to what the next experiment might be. I think there's lead in my water. I run a lead test. Oh my God, the lead test strip came back blue. Am I done? No. I want to do quantitative analysis. How much lead is in the water? One part per trillion. Drink the water. So as we go through this iterative process, and we do it so well in the basic sciences, it's evidence-based science. Why can't we have evidence-based entrepreneurship? And the answer is we can't. But we've come out of 50 years of Silicon Valley of faith-based innovation, faith-based entrepreneurship. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Pets.com, because dogs can't drive. <laughs> they haven't met my dog. Um, underneath all these failures is data. So you say, wow, the venture capital industry, 10% of their portfolios actually make money, and the truth is only 10% of that 10% make a lot of money. They're in the hits business. You would think, hey, we can help you fail less. You would be wrong. Because that's not the industry reward, is to have marginally fewer failures. And by the way, any entrepreneurs that take money from a venture capitalist, here's the truth. As soon as the money is in your account, their business model becomes your business model. And I have seen many companies who could have successfully exited at modest returns, but most venture guys, and if you're in the room, I'm not talking about you because you're all wonderful, it's the other guys. <laughs> um, if it's not going to be a 10x, why bother? Well, but, but you're the entrepreneur, you have a portfolio of one. They have a portfolio of 40. And the reason you need a portfolio, back to the genomic aspect, is you want to have diversity of risk. Uh, investing in one movie is a fool's errand. Investing in 15 movies in a portfolio, you will outperform the market, according to Merrill Lynch. So my innovation capital is really an opportunity to build institutional knowledge. But the intellectual exhaust of the failed experiments could potentially be condensed into jet fuel for the next set of experiments and we lose it. Every erased whiteboard, every thrown out post-it note, every deleted email could inspire someone to create something great. But we don't have that data. We don't capture it, we don't institutionalize it, we do not leverage it. So everyone talks about the moonshot, right? Joe Biden's got the moonshot for cancer, Peter Diamandis with the X Prize has moonshots for damn near anything you can imagine. Let's go back to 1960, the original moonshot. Yuri Gregarin has circled the globe, we're going to lose the entire Milky Way to Russia. <laughs> Horrible idea. And John Kennedy says, we are going to the moon by the end of the decade. So imagine for the moment you are an astronaut. It is 1960, and John Kennedy says this. You're excited, right? Pop the champagne, all that training, all that conditioning, all that sacrifice. You could be that person going to the moon. Pretty exciting, right? And then you do a little research. In 1960, there were 38 orbital launches, and 19 blew up. You know, well, maybe uh, you should go first. <laughs> I don't have to be the first. I'm happy to be the 39th. So this is a problem. The science wasn't ready for the opportunity. So the newly formed National Aeronautics and Space Administration sat down with the Department of Defense to see how we could improve the process of science. Now you can imagine two federal agencies collaborating on creating a system and then documenting it in a document. How huge must that document be, right? One page. They, defined, they define the technology readiness level. 
Anyone got a napkin? Make a sketch. It's a TRL one. I have no idea. Do a breadboard prototype, do a field test. TRL 9, you're going to the moon, you're coming back, bring me a moon rock. It's going to happen. So you say, well, that's amazing. All these different technologies lend themselves to a simple metric. If you remember in the 1980s, for those of you who have a memory that goes back that far, there was a big rush to do total quality management, TQM. Who doesn't want more quality? Raise your hand if you're against quality. No hands going. But until GE adopted Six Sigma, which is a way of quantifying the process of improving quality, people were just giving slide presentations, hugging trees, and you know, pretending it was going to get better because they wanted it to get better. But they quantified it. And TRLs quantify it. And I'm here to tell you that IRLs quantify risk in portfolios of innovation. An investment readiness level, and this is where the cameras come out. Go ahead, take the slide picture. Great, very good. Investment readiness level says how much risk is in this idea? And imagine if you've got transparency to talk about, it's not I don't like you, it's not about political, it's not about opacity, you're an IRL3. We don't invest in IRL3s. And you say, well, I can be an IRL4 if I can just do 20 more interviews, it's gonna take me 6,000 bucks, give me a month, please. You go, yeah, all right, we can do that. You need to build a $30 million factory, it's gonna take you three years, and maybe you'll be an IRL5, I don't think so. IRL is not the only part of a complex formula, but it's one of the missing links. And it really talks about the higher the investment readiness level, the lower the risk. And if you want to build a repeatable, scalable business model, you want to build a rocket that's going to take you to the moon safely, you need to decentralize and, 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 and disaggregate all the little pieces and understand each one of them on their own. Anyone been to the supermarket in the last 20 years? No matter what aisle you go down, no matter what you buy, there is a nutritional fact label. We can break nutrition down to its core components. If you are diabetic, I recommend avoiding the sugar. I actually recommend avoiding everything on the screen. Um, if you've got a heart problem, let's avoid the salt. Low carb diets, you know what to eat. If we can understand nutrition at a tiny level of data, why can't we understand innovation? The answer is we can, we just have chosen not to. So if you want to be an evidence-based innovator, an evidence-based investor, the tools are there. The goal, again, is to find the patterns in the data. Understanding what you choose to invest in, and, and one of the things we talk at Stanford and Berkeley with my students, I believe they'll all be able to raise the money. <coughs> Should they? The biggest investment is their time. If they can get a signal now that three years from now it's probably a dry well, I don't care if the investors lost money, that's their business, that's what they do. But I care about the three years of opportunity you might have lost if you believe it's really worth that investment, that critical resource, then that's kind of a sign to go forward and dive into the data business. You are all in the data business, whether you know it or not. So there's a case study, and unfortunately this graphic didn't quite review it, but we looked at our 15,000 teams, 500,000 interviews, and 50,000 pivots. And what we found is it takes about 50 to 60 interviews to really get a strong signal something's right. But we are more often wrong than we are right. So the invalid to valid ratio is about 7.6 to 1. So when I have a business model canvas, which I'll show you what they look like in a minute. For those who've never seen it, you will. It's an ontology and a way of describing pieces of a business. There's about nine boxes. Each has two or three guesses. Actually, tuition at Yale is high enough. We call them hypotheses. If tuition is low, it's a guess. If it's high, it's a hypothesis. <laughs> and, and you're going to gather a building and figure out which ones are right and which ones are wrong. So you're going to be wrong 7.6 times for every time you're right. Just accept that as a norm. If you're slightly better, that's great. If you're slightly worse, that's fine. But if you're three standard deviations of normal on one side or the other, there's a problem. So we worked with a corporation and we said, oh my God, these folks are dead. How could they innovate? They have, they're wrong 41 times. Never saw a number that bad. We figured this, if it was a public company, I would short it. If it was a private company, I could not. And I was so glad I didn't work there. They thought that millennials was a customer segment. Who thinks millennials is a, is a customer segment? Anyone? Yeah. The 18-year-old college kid who's hungover and the 27-year-old married female lawyer in New York with two kids, they're both millennials. Nothing in common. And they assured me that hospitals was their customer segment. We sell some of our products to hospitals. And I said, really? So I'm going to go down to the Stanford Hospital, I'm going to give them my card, and they're just going to give me a bag of money right there at the reception desk. And they said, well, no, silly. We sell the cardiothoracic surgeons. And I said, okay. So I'm going to go scrub, put on my 
Grey's Anatomy outfit. I'm going to walk in the operating room. I say, excuse me, doctor. And they're going to go, yeah, the money's under the table. And then it's right there, right? Say, oh, of course not. So there's a woman named Susan Jones in purchasing who's responsible for cardiothoracic supplies. OK, now that sounds like a customer. All hospitals? Well, they have to have at least 300 beds, urban center. OK, now I'm understanding a segment. But when you start limiting the segment, sometimes the market size gets really small. So you have to kind of be recursive in your analysis. Well, what these folks did after their first cohort is they were geniuses. Everyone in the first cohort became a mentor to a team in the second cohort and so on. They have set the gold standard. They know how to do discovery and innovation because they accelerate the time to truth by formulating better hypotheses. They say to each other, that's not a customer segment. One of their value propositions was they have an insulation material and it was good to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And I said, who cares? I said, no, you understand. 300 degrees Fahrenheit. I said, yeah, no, that's really hot. Why do I care? That's not a value proposition. It's a technical spec. And they assured me it was a value proposition. I said, I'm pretty sure someone doesn't take a job description, wanted, hire someone to buy 300. No. All right, let's assume I'm an idiot. I own a factory, I have machines, and I don't buy your insulation. Son of a gun, my machine hits 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Who cares? We don't understand. The machine will blow up. I said, so what? People will die. Value proposition. You're going to save lives. All right. So the coroner comes. They take the bodies out. We're back in business. Oh, no, 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 no. The factory shut down for three or four months. Value proposition. Who cares about that? Insurance companies. They're insuring the lives. They're insuring the plant. Who else cares about this? And you start talking about customer segments, value propositions, product market fit, and the ability to get away from an engineering definition of a technical spec that no one cares about. When we teach at i -Corps, I believe your molecule will do everything you say. Who am I to argue with you? You're a genius. Who cares? Military, industrial, consumer, channels of distribution. How are you going to do this? Which means you're faster. It doesn't take this company two years anymore to evaluate their ideas. It takes them eight weeks. Every eight weeks, they are stress testing with hundreds of interviews the best ideas from this amazing technology. So as you look at the teams and the diversity of the teams, here's the problem. The worst team we ever taught at Berkeley where we had four male Indian engineers. They were super smart. Their resumes were amazing. Their LinkedIn profiles. And Steve and I put them on a team because we figured we're going to learn so much from these people that it was kind of a faculty indulgence, right? This is our chance to just really suck down some knowledge. I don't even want, know what area of engineering they had, but it was something that we were really intensely curious about. They show up at the first class and they say, we have already pivoted. We go, wow, that's amazing. You haven't done any work yet. He goes, no, no, no. We did some research and we found an area in the market that there's no one in, and it's a huge market, so we are going to do this. Just tell us more. We are going to build a website for women to buy wedding dresses. And we go, that's very funny. Really, what are you going to do? He goes, no, no, no. We're going to build a website because there aren't any for women to buy wedding dresses. We go, are any of the guys married? They said, no. We knew the answer to the next question, but we had to ask it. Do any of you have girlfriends? <laughs> They said no. Are any women advising you? They said no. We said, OK. It's your, it's your grade. Knock yourself out. In the fifth week, they were going nowhere. Steve went up to the board, and he drew the largest letter, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, sixth letter of the alphabet, a huge four-foot-tall F. And he says, any of you ever seen that grade before? And they said, no, sir. I said, well, you will see that grade if you come back next week with a website for women to buy wedding dresses. So they pivoted back to the original idea, and I swear I wish I knew what it was, but I know in four weeks the class was over and they made so much progress on a really interesting piece of science and application. But they had no relevant domain perspective to bring to the problem. You know, the, the whole word pivot is very fashionable. Sounds really cool. Michael Jordan pivots, Wayne Gretzky pivots. When I was building my first startup, we called this a near-death experience. <laughs> and the thing about a pivot, though, if you know anything about basketball, is one foot is stationary, 
right? And the other foot is moving. And we see companies stick with the same technology but go to a different market, or stick with the same market but go to a different technology. So many ways to move, but when you don't move, there was a great study done by failed startups that said the reason they failed was premature scaling. What the hell does that mean? It means that they just spent the money anyway. I mean, it's like crazy. That's a meaningless phrase. It's like listening to Kelly and Conway. Um, <laughs> but I go on. Um, so the culture, not only forgiving failure, but expecting failure, building it into the effort, the metrics, the measurement of progress, and sharing the learnings, whether it's through presentations or through online platforms or tools, because what you don't want is to make the same damn mistake over and over again. And as you're able to acquire this new database of collective intelligence, think how much smarter you and your company and your teams can become. So I'm gonna give you a real live study. We had a large healthcare company, and you have to assume for the moment that what I'm telling you is mostly true. Imagine an ointment could be sold for maybe $20, $30 a tube, like a tube of toothpaste. And if you were sunburned and you smeared this ointment on, two things would happen. The pain would go away almost immediately, better than aloe or butter or whatever other thing you might treat your burns with. But at a cellular level, it would actually retard significantly the possibility of skin cancer. So after the burn, and before the cancer, this magic cream could do something. Go, wow, really? And they go, yeah, why not? So imagine where you might sell this kind of a cream. Anyone have an idea? Seriously, this is where we get the um, audience interaction. Anyone have an idea of where you might sell this afterburn cream? Anyone? Dermatologist. Dermatologist, maybe there'll be a channel. Yeah, I mean, they wouldn't necessarily apply it themselves. Anyone else? Athletes, right? Right, you, you know, that's a distribution channel, but who would actually use the cream? Who would want this? Yeah, so, so possibly people already with cancer. Um, we've got parents with young children, we've got construction workers, we've got military, they have like nine customer segments. Who wouldn't want this amazing cream? So they came up with a list. They had nine customer segments. And they got out of the building and they talked to hundreds of customers. You know what parents with young kids do? They put on sunscreen. They don't need afterburn. They took a video of a construction worker and I swear his face was as red as a lobster. I, you hurt from his sunburn. And they zoom in on the camera and they say, sir, what do you do for sunburn? And he looks in the lens and goes, I don't get sunburn. <laughs> There's a high tolerance for pain. In the military, if you don't go out because you're sunburned, you get court-martialed. You will go fight. Every segment began to evaporate. And in the process of the evidence, they did stumble across one person. And we said, so tell me, if no one cares about what the sun can do to destroy my skin, are there other times when the cellular degeneration of the sun can create bad effects? It turns out there is. So as this market is evaporating, they found, after 171 interviews, they're in the valley of death. This really cool patent is going nowhere. It turns out that if you are undergoing radiation for cancer, about 10% of patients suffer radiation dermatitis. And unfortunately, they had photos to show us this condition. You do not want to see what radiation dermatitis looks like. But you have to stop the radiation, which means you haven't treated the underlying benefits that it could give you to fight cancer. So it's not after the burn and before the cancer. It's actually after the cancer and before the radiation burn. You go, wow. So what would that look like? Do you know which patients will get radiation dermatitis? The answer is no. So what you're telling me is every patient undergoing radiation therapy might benefit from a prophylactic application of your miracle cream that would prevent radiation dermatitis. Would it prevent radiation dermatitis? Yeah, about 99.9% .9 of the time. You go, holy crap, that's amazing. But if you've got this cream and you've got that market, how are you gonna get it into the market? Anyone ever seen, been, or had done a sonogram? 
right? There's a machine like the goop dispenser. It's like it's right there. And it's not there. You don't do the sonogram. How do you get a goop dispenser in every radiation lab? Who buys it? Who distributes it? How do you get your goop in that machine? Is that even feasible? <laughs> it turns out the canvas got much easier. This is a business model canvas, by the way. So Alexander Osterwalder, PhD in business ontology. How cool is that for a PhD? Really? Is that amazing? He wrote a book called Business Model Generation. And Alexander describes customer segments, value propositions, channels, and uh, the customer relationship on the right side of the canvas, desirability. He talks about the key activities, key resources, and partners on the left side, feasibility, revenues, and costs on the bottom. And that's a business model. That's one way of looking at it. Ash Mariah has a version. There's a mission model canvas, a bunch of different flavors. But the idea is these are the components of business. And if you start understanding the interrelationship, these guys stumbled onto almost a $1.4 billion market to treat radiation dermatitis, not sunburn. Hey, I've got a great idea for a business. That's exciting. Tell me about it. I've developed a chemical isomer that links to volatile organic compounds causing carbon bonds to rupture and wraps them in a nanotube coating. Huh, that's a little confusing. Can you dump it down for me? Sure. What I do is I take a proprietary isomer that I developed with a picric acid wash that hollows out the carbon bonds and replaces them with a nanotube wrapping. Okay, so I guess it's pretty technical. Oh yeah. I've been working on this isomer for nine years. So what's the business idea? To sell it. To who? Everybody will want one. What for? So they can wrap their volatile organic compounds in carbon nanotubes. Hmm. I think you might need a target customer. I don't think I need to wrap my compounds in your nanotube. Well, maybe not you. So, for people who buy it, what's the value you are providing them? I've developed a chemical isomer that links to volatile organic compounds causing carbon bonds to rupture and wraps them in a nanotube coating. You've said that already. This is getting annoying. Why should anyone care about your isomer? I spent nine years on this. I know that. Okay, pretend I'm an investor. How can I make money off your product? By selling it. You're a smart guy, but try not to think like a scientist. Think like a business person. Okay. Value chain. Term sheet. I have to go now and answer that. That's not your phone. I know. I don't even know what to say about this. I mean, this is so often the pitch and the business from a purely scientific perspective. Um, and you know, I spent nine years on this. Is hardly the reason to make an investment of time, money, and resources. So hopefully this morning you'll remember that James Comey was fired last night. You'll remember that season two, episode 17 of South Park was an amazing insight into the world of innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, and that you don't need to uh, have a carbon nanotube wrapping anything of yours uh, if you don't want to. And I think we have a few minutes if there are any questions. John, we can take a few. I'm, I realize I'm standing between you and coffee, so I don't want to drag this out any longer than we need to. Anyone? No. Fabulous. OK. Oh, we have a question. Please. Hi there. I can see you. Thank you. It's like a I'll start again. My name is Eleanor. Hi, and Eleanor. I'm, I'm working on a startup called Orpheus VR, and um, it's utilizing virtual reality. And my question to you is: I see um, your, you know, business cases and models for a product, but um, what about in terms of service versus a product? Um, there is no difference. Um, in fact, pricing models often evolve into, you know software as a service or X, AAS, anything as a service. We had a team at Stanford that um, began with, the, the original name was Autonomo. They were going to create an autonomous lawnmower, Roomba for lawns, because who wants to mow a lawn, right? 
And it was, no, it was vision recognition technology, right? Camera, software, I know what I'm looking at. If it was a tree, it would go around it. If it was rocks, the, the blades would raise. And it would mow massive amounts of lawn. It started as a product. Um, and they went out and talked to 17 people with responsibilities for mowing massive amounts of lawn. Huge market. And they heard two things. One is that they're competing with immigrant labor and the machine, because it was Stanford, was gonna cost like 100,000 um, bucks. And what if it made a mistake? It would run over a dog, an arm, it would kill somebody, insurance costs much too much. So they said, okay, we cannot sell this machine. And they were really depressed. This is two weeks into the course and they have nothing. Like no one wants an autonomous lawnmower. Who could have possibly figured that out? Um, and one of the team members' uncle was an organic carrot farmer. And he goes, so vision recognition technology, I don't know what that means, but I have a problem, you see. I, I grow carrots, there's a lot of weeds, and I've got immigrant labor pulling what they think are weeds. I'm sure they're pulling carrots. Can you guys do two things? Can you both identify with vision recognition a weed versus a carrot? Can you organically kill the weeds? Because if you can, I'd be interested. So they retool, it turns out under their computer and analysis, weed, carrot, black, white, totally different. And they built this huge contraption, they called it the carrot bot, in a week. It looked like a Rube Goldberg machine. When it saw a weed, it would take a, a, a needle and inject hot organic oil under the, so under the soil, and it would kill the weeds, amazing. And they go back and they demo this to the farmer, and literally tears flowing down his cheeks, the most amazing thing you've ever seen. And of course, what's it gonna cost? $100,000, kids from Stanford. And they go, well, I can't afford that. And he goes, well, no problem, we'll lease it to you, right? And they go, no, lease is a purchase over time. I only need it for five weeks every crop cycle. And they go, well, how is that possible? Well, after five weeks, a carrot is a carrot. Everything else must be a weed. My five-year-old could do the weeding then. I only for five weeks. So they said, okay, how big's your farm? 100 acres. All right, let's try this. You take five acres, you do exactly what you're doing. We'll take 95 acres, and we're gonna be your weeding company. You'll pay us exactly what you pay that, uh, as a service, the immigrant labor. But when we harvest the crop, we're gonna harvest your five acres, and then the other 95 acres, we get half the crop yield improvement, because we're the only thing different. That was the deal. The Node gave them, the Node Coastal gave them $4 million, Blue River Technologies was 10 weeks after Autonomo, the autonomous lawnmower. Turns out it's not about carrots and weeds. As they got further in the marketplace, it's about lettuce and spacing. If you plant lettuce and they're too close together, they encroach on the growth potential of each plant. So they use vision recognition and algorithms to optimally space the plants that should remain and zap the ones that are in the way. In the Salinas Valley, we harvest lettuce 365 days a year. So it's a continuous flow process. It's a service. It happens to have technology, and I'm guessing your VR has some hardware and some software, but it's a pricing model. If you think about that canvas, it's the lower right corner. How does the customer want to acquire your technology? It may be as a purchase, it may be as a lease, it may be as a service. The biggest problem is it may not be at all. So if you've got someone saying, I love this, I can't live without this, then you have the privilege of talking about pricing. But the problem a lot of people is you go out with, you've heard the word minimum viable product. Often it's not even a product. Um, we had a team at Berkeley that was doing something. Um, they, <laughs> they wanted to create like Spider-Man, a wristlet that would have Purell built in. And in a hospital or a clinic, you know, you gotta keep those hands clean, right? Otherwise you could transmit diseases, MRSA, all kinds of superbugs. So it would trigger a little splash of Purell on the doctor's and the clinician's hands when they would enter a room. Genius. So they talked to some people. First of all, they actually got out of the building and went into some clinics and hospitals. The only thing more ubiquitous in a hospital than beds are Purell machines, They're like every five feet. They're in every room. Turns out that they didn't need a wrist guard. They needed to put an RFID chip on a card and on all the machines and understand if, or if you actually dispensed Purell. And if you're in the room for less than three minutes, it could just be how you're feeling today, goodbye. If you're in for more than three minutes and that machine doesn't distribute some lotion, you're probably not in compliance. They built nothing. They mocked up a report. And they went to the head of compliance in the hospital who would be really interested and said, so if I could give you a report like this, would you want that? And they said, hell yes, how fast can you do this? They did nothing, they built nothing. They didn't build the damn wrist thing, that was stupid. But they realized that there was a need and it was a data need. So they built the company to provide the service of the reports by putting in the sensors and the monitors. So again, it's, it's getting the signal of what the customer wants 
and then understanding the model you have to construct to see if there's a viable opportunity in doing that. So it comes down to why do I want your VR? How is it going to help me? Is it commercial, is it industrial, is it consumer? What are my alternatives? And if there is resonance, and you'll know it. You'll know it because they're leaning in. They lock the door. She can't go. I, I need this. How fast can you get this for me? If you have that kind of a conversation, you have the privilege of figuring out price and model. Does that make sense? Join me in thanking Jim. Thank you. Thank you.